Hello, this is Alice Formiga of eOrganic, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Going Organic, Breeding Biofortified Field Pea and Sorghum. eOrganic has many articles, videos, and webinars about organic farming and research at eOrganic.org, and we're recording this presentation, and you'll be able to find it on the eOrganic YouTube channel within one to two weeks. So today, I'm very pleased to welcome a team of researchers from Clemson University who've been working together on a NIFA OREI funded breeding project. First, Dil Sabaraja, who's an associate professor of pulse quality and nutrition, will be discussing organic field pea biofortification. Then Tristan Lawrence, who's a research associate and field technician, will talk about the field tri trials that they've conducted, as well as pest and weed management. Rick Boyles, who is an assistant professor in genetics, will then discuss sorghum breeding, and then we'll have a question and answer session, and we'll be joined by Emerson Scheip, who is a professor of agronomy. So now I will hand over the screen to the project leader, Dil Thamaraja. Thank you so much. Um, our project is going organic. It's a platform that we developed at the Clemson University to enhance this breeding on pulse crops and cereals. First, I would like to say about our team, PD and co-PD, and I am so delighted to work with Dr. Rick Boyles. And this is a, some sort of a, a message from me as a working with Rick. I found it is so enjoyable. Rick and I have been working on this project before we submit the proposal almost an year uh, brainstorming, talking to the stakeholders, preparing their um, written document, and talking to the experts. So always, if you're running a very big program or very big project, you need to have a really good co-PD. And then I'm really thankful to Dr. Boyles. He's an assistant professor, and uh, he's expert of sorghum breeding, wheat breeding, and genetics. Behind the, behind the real scene, there is a uh, load of people, like a lot of people helping us to this project get successful, especially our senior advisory team, Dr. Steve Krasovich, and he is the one advising us on the, the genomic side of this project. And also I'm really grateful to Dr. Maggie, and she was generous giving us her breeding uh, lines to uh, evaluate at at Clemson University, South Carolina. Also, Dr. Scheib, he's my in-house breeder for my program, and then Dr. Kumar from ICARDA. So all those senior, uh, senior key members, they have been tremendous help on this project. And also this project has a lot of innovation with the uh, graduate students and the student interns, especially our PhD students, three PhD students working on this project, Sarah, AJ and Nathan partly working on this and also student interns. Um, not the least, our team, the field team and also the lab team. I have a, a high throughput uh, phenotyping lab and then uh, Mr. Adam K, he's the lab manager running our lab smoothly, getting all these thousands of samples analyzed and getting data. So this team actually does a really good job on getting work done on the right timing. Our advisory board, I'm really thankful, and also the, our, our communication team from the Clemson Extension. They are doing a tremendous job on success, getting successful on this um, project. Rick and I, when we start this project, our first uh, objective was to find out what is the critical need of organic agriculture. According to USDA 1995 definition, organic agriculture defined as an ecological production management system that promotes enhanced biodiversity, biological cycle, and bioecological activity. So what does this mean? Organic means it enhances the whole system. So we have to come up with system approach for enhance the organic agriculture. So he and I come up with the idea, how about we rotate pulses with cereals in South Carolina, and what type of pulses could be fit into this agriculture system? Also, what type of cereal uh, fit into um, this type of system? And South Carolina is home for 2000, uh, 25,000 farms, totaling 5 million acres. 
and increasing crop production costs and decreasing commodity prices have a problem for our growers. Therefore, they're looking for new options. You can see the South Carolina commodity map, peas or lentils, uh, not in that map, but mostly it is like corn, uh, cotton, and most of the um, soybean, those are the most uh, demanding um, commodities as well as sorghum. So we thought cool season food legumes and traditional cereals such as the sorghum, which is gluten-free, allergen-free, combining with pulses might fit into this definition of the organic agriculture. And the next thing we did was we looking at the, what are the critical stakeholder needs. What we found was there is a need for the organic production system. There is no cultivars of sorghum or field peas developed just for organic production. So there is a huge work need to be done to make this crop better for this kind of organic system. And also nutrition quality grading. My previous job at North Dakota State University, I started the National U.S. Pulse Quality Survey. So one of the reports that I made for these are conventionally grown um, pulses. And it's continuing every year, uh, the report coming from North Dakota State. But can we do something like this for organic produce, organic pulses and organic cereals? So they will have a nutrition quality grading, like for example, 20 to 30% protein for the premium market and the cereals at least to 10 to 15% of protein in the cereal. And marketing and the grade trade is so important because organic market is so small and therefore we have a limited number of buyers. And when we wrote this proposal, the limited public research was available regarding the uh, pulse breeding as well as the sorghum breeding. So we thought of developing a large data set on genomic and the phenomic. Also, we create the breeding pipeline and test these varieties into the organic system as a system approach. So what is our system approach? Our approach is called nutritional breeding food system approach. This is a little bit more than the green revolution to the greener revolution. Yes, we are working on the yield. At the same time, we want to balance our nutrition quality, a greener revolution that will provide not just more food, but more nutritious food. That will help ending resilience on supplements and the food fortification program. Organic food is a, uh, it's a new demand with the COVID-19 and people having more diseases to the pesticide, allergens. So organic food demand is getting increased, especially organic protein market and the animal food market. So all these things are getting, um, getting uh, high demand. So our idea is to have the human health as the number one goal and then put that idea into the breeding program and increase the yield with the nutrition quality. So once the breeding is happening, we wanted to actually encourage our consumers, the food processing uh, people, to make sure this nutrition quality stays there and these nutrients going to be bioavailable and also we conduct the educational workshops. And what we are looking is improve human health can be achieved by changing the paradigm for agriculture. So that's what this figure, this figure, this is how we conduct our breeding program, engage with the society and they're making good food to reduce the human, um, to combat obesity and malnutrition. So the, with that, our uh, project goal, the long-term goal is to develop the biofortified organic field pea and sorghum cultivars for organic cropping system. The first thing we have to look at is how these varieties or the breeding lines adapted into the agronomic um, setup of the organic system, grain yield, agronomic adaptability. And the next thing we wanted to look at once they adapted, how is the nutrition quality? So with all this information, can we look at the genomic and bioinformatic capability of this diverse populations of peas and so uh, and, and then we conduct a lot of on-farm education. In this picture that you can see, these uh, students, they are making organic-based uh, breakfast 
and they will know how to utilize the sorghum or they will know how to use the organic feed. So we have a consumer education program and also we educate the growers. And this is like a system approach from farm to the table. And now I wanted to talk about uh, what's going on with our COP last two years, what we were working on. So POP, Pisum Satinum, peas are grown and consumed as either fresh or dry seeds. This is one of the oldest crops uh, planted uh, 7,000 to 6,000 BC, and it was uh, one of the oldest cultivated plants deployed with the chromosome number of seven. And two species are there. One is the uh, white color flower, and the other one is the colored flower, two classes Basically, we have garden peas and the fuel peas. Dr. Maggie is interested on more of the vegetable peas, but our breeding program, we more interested on the dry pea uh, production for South Carolina. There are different growth habits, determinant and indeterminate growth, and annual or winter annual herbaceous plant. This, win uh, this pea is adapted to our winter here in South Carolina. So here is the experimental design that we came up with because it's the rotation of study. So what we first thought is that we will put a one acre of blanket field pea as a commercial cultivation. And then adjacent to that commercial cultivation, we will have range of field pea elite cultivars and the breeding line in the, in the winter. And then once this crop is planted in January and harvested in late April to early May, Sorghum will be planted in late May and uh, with the rotation. You can see the commercial pea, uh, Rick's, uh, Dr. Boyer's sorghum will go on top of that. And then our peas, once we harvested that, we planted the one acre of commercial sorghum, um, sorghum line. So what we see is the how the rotational benefit effect on the crops. So we had two lo two years, two locations, and these are the, uh, for the peas, we had 25 cultivars and 19 breeding lines were donated from uh, Dr. Maggie's program to test it in this uh, study. So here is the growing condition. Tristan is going to talk more about this. And, but I want to just glance about it. So two years, 2019 and 2020. 2019, we had two locations, Clemson and Pellion. You can see how the temperature ranges from centigrade uh, 6 to 23. That's the range of temperature that uh, throughout the growing season. And also um, precipitation, you can see the range from uh, January to May. So that type of, uh, that. Actually, that weather is really good for cool season food legumes. And all the field locations were USDA certified, and two locations were Pellion and Clemson. These are two different soils. Pellion has the sandy loam soil, and the Clemson has the clay loam. So seeding rate was 90 seeds per uh, square meter for the plot. But the commercial one, we put, I think, 120 pounds per acre, but we could have increased the seeding rate for more. Tristan will talk a little bit more about the field preparation and the management. And here is the data because I wanted to show uh, what, what the distribution look like. The grain yield is actually for these 52 advanced elite lines and the breeding lines range from 500 kilograms per hectare to 3,500. 3, it's a quite a bit of range. And most of the varieties were ranged between 1,000 to 2,000 kilograms per hectare. And that is pretty good in the first time going on the organic one. And when we look at the two sites, Clemson has the uh, clay loam soil, which is a very, very good soil in that organic farm management was really, really well. The both farms are really well, but two different soils, so nitrogen contribution is different. So Clemson always has a higher yield compared to the rolls, but they have a two different management systems. Um, and then when you look at the protein, we found also the normal distribution, it ranged from 21 to 50. And uh, this is the seed size, and we found the correlation between the different uh, genetic traits. And uh, because we are emphasis on nutrition quality, I'm going to show a little bit about protein and probiotic carbohydrate work. 
because prebiotic carbohydrate is important for the gut health, which is the part of the things we study in our lab that we know that eating 100 gram of lentils will increase the bifidobacteria in the gut. So we target on specific prebiotic carbohydrates in the breeding program. So we found, what we found was we have the numbers from the conventional and we have numbers from the organic. Most of these organic nutrition data is quite similar to the conventional numbers. And uh, protein range from 12 to 34 and the mean was 21. Um, grams per 100 gram. By eating 100 gram of POPs, you can get 14 to 26 grams of prebiotic carbohydrate. These are low digestible carbohydrate. This will increase the gut health. And that's why we are saying this will help to the reduce, uh, reduce the obesity and the overweight. This is very important. And when we look at the other side, how these um, were uh, these populations were distribu distributed, and most of them are normally distributed. And we found some varieties have high, some varieties have low. And we also calculate the heritability estimates for this two-year data. And some of the some of these sugars are highly heritable; some of them are not. So this is very interesting. And uh, we found this data quite similar to the conventional, um, and it is quite doable to have an organic breeding program. And here is the gain the minerals and the phytic acid because we have done uh, all the human available, human required essential minerals, as well as we measure the phytic acid that, that's the inositol phosphate. The idea behind this, most of the sorghum or some peas can be used as a human food or animal, uh, animal feed. Uh, Minerals can be binded phytic acid and make a uh, complex and can be less bioavailable. So you can see these highlighted lines with the yield and they have a correlation with these elements. So these lines are actually doing really, really good. Most of these lines came from Canada. And for 2019 and 2020, these are the promising lines because our growers, if they want to test some of these, because we know few growers in South Carolina, they are already growing this crop. So these are the uh, most promising cultivars for the moment. And we incorporate these into our breeding program. If you want particular data, you can go to our Going Organic Clemson University uh, breeding website and you can download all this data. And going forward, um, it is very exciting because organic pea production is possible. Yes, I can understand organic management is difficult, but once you start doing this, it's automatically and it's produced a it, it gives a real joy with the with the uh, how you can save the planet and going organic is something sustainable and. What we are doing right now, we are having our breeding pipeline set up. So this is the picture Dr. Scheib is taking uh, notes from our diversify panel. And then we are making some uh, genomic tools, uh, especially for the nutrition quality yield and the protein. And uh, uh, graduate students are making quite a difference and in the innovation of this project. And we have a quite a bit of publications coming out this project as well. And also we start doing a planting date trial because um, we wanted to uh, play with a little bit of our planting day and see whether we could plant instead of January, whether we could plant in November. So we having these studies going on as well. And the uh, nurseries have been planted this year and still we are conducting on farm uh, studies. With that, I'd like to acknowledge all the our funders, uh, especially USDA NIFA, OREI program funded this project, but it extended into the many other different projects. And I would, especially, I would like to thank you, the uh, two breeders from Canada, Dr. Tom Walkington and Dr. Bean. And they have been generous and uh, giving us a lot of information and sharing some material with us. And then all of this, this project is not possible without having all these people helping us and working together. And thank you. Okay, so I'm going to pass over the screen control to um, Tristan. So Tristan, you should just have the control now. So if you click on it, 
um, with your mouse, right. you should be able to advance with the arrows. There you go. Oops. All right, jump back. All right, good afternoon or good morning. I hope everyone's doing well and having a nice Friday so far. Um, my name is Tristan Lawrence, and I'm the field technician for the Pulse Quality and Nutritional Breeding Program. Today, I'll just be covering uh, on the same topic of field peas and going through our first two years of organic field trials and their management. So our first two years of the, bre of the breeding program consisted of uh, current elite cultivars that are currently in production are provided by Meridian Seeds and Pulse USA, as, as well as some advanced breeding lines from Rebecca McGee at the USDA ARS Pulse Breeding Program in Pullman. So we had 25 and 29, so we added a few the second year um, for both. And then we also had the germplasm collection, which is the P single plant plus collection. That was um, provided by the USDA ARS in Pullman as well. And we had just under about 300 lines. So these are our field locations. Um, primarily, we just had two. There was a third, but due to some issues, we didn't have it anymore. Um, but WP Rawl is our on-farm location. And if you can see, it's the blue pen. That's about a little south of Columbia. And then we have Calhoun Field Laboratory, or Clemson's Organic Farm, which is in the upper left of the map, which is in orange. So that is in Clemson. Then we also have PD Research and Education Center, which is in green uh, near Florence. So for our field design, um, all the trials were a randomized complete block design with border plots around the perimeter. Um, and each varied in either two to three replicates depending on seed and field space. So you can kind of see an example of what our plot plans would look like to your right. Um, for the advanced trials, our plots were 20 feet long by five feet wide. We had seven rows on seven and a half inch spacing uh, at a rate of 90 seeds per meter squared with five foot alleys. So that's the space at the end of the plots. Um, and then our germplasm trials were a little bit smaller due to limited seed, but they were four feet long and five feet wide with, it was only four rows. So they're kind of head rows on 15 inch spacing. So for planting, um, you can see the dates here for our first year and our second year, which are fairly close. Um, our advanced trial, we used an Almeco con cone plant plot planter, uh, which you can see in picture one. Um, then for our germplasm trials to plant the head rows, we used a head row plot planter, which you can see in picture two. And then for our commercial blanket, blanket anchor of peas, we used a conventional grain drill which you can see in uh, the third picture. We did apply an inoculant. Uh, it was a granular inoculant at four pounds per acre uh, that was applied with the seed at planting. So here are just some pictures of us actually planting. Um, uh, picture number one is Clemson's crop improvement team planting our advanced trials at WP Rawl. Um, number two and number three we're actually Rick Boyles planting our germplasm for us. Um, thank you for him doing that. That was hard work. And then number four is also planting our advanced trials. So evaluating the trials, um, we had a number of criteria uh, that we evaluated, but the main agronomic traits were germination, vigor, days to flower, days to maturity, vine length, canopy height, canopy closure, lodging, pod height, pods per peduncle, and disease and insect resistance. Uh, in the first picture, we have Dr. Scheip uh, evaluating our advanced trials. And then the other three photos are uh, Dr. Dill and Dr. Rebecca McGee evaluating some advanced trials. For data collection, uh, for our evaluations, we use two apps, but the main app used was Fieldbook, um, which is a pheno app application. So it allows us to facilitate and record data collection for our main agronomic traits. So it's super useful. It, um, 
where we can collect data, photos, and notes all in one platform, and then easily export it as a CSV file so we can put it into Excel and do what we need to do. Um, the photo here on the right just kind of shows all the possibilities of different traits you can create um, depending on how, what you're trying to evaluate. So it's very customizable. So the other app is Canopia, which from Oklahoma State. And this allows us to um, approximate the canopy closure. So it's just the percentage of green or live vegetation. So if you look at the original image, that's just a photo you would take with the app on your phone or tablet. And then it kind of converts it over into this black and white photo. And the black symbolizes kind of the ground or the non-vegetation. So for harvest, um, the harvest dates are below. They were all around, first year was around 113, 115 days. Our second year was a little longer. Um, so to harvest our advanced trials, we use an Almeco uh, plot combine with a platform header. We harvested them into either cloth bags or paper bags. They were then stored in a drying bin and then we cleaned them using an air seed cleaner and sieves. So our germplasm trials, unfortunately, can be harvested uh, mechanically. So we had to do it by hand. Um, so we put it into mesh harvest bags and then they were transported and dried and then had to be threshed. So here are just some pictures of harvest. Um, in the first photo, that is us having to harvest the germplasm by hand um, and the second and third, and that is harvesting our advanced trials. So if you can see, we just sit there and harvest the plot and it goes into the bag and we move on to the next. And then the fourth photo is when we harvested our commercial acre. So it held all the seed and then we had to off put it into a large bag to transport. And here are just a couple more photos of these are the germplasm once they've been harvested. Um, and this is the drying bin. So it has a fan and a heater if needed. So they sit in there and dry to get all the moisture out so they can be properly threshed. So as far as organic management, um, you know, field preparations are very important. So leading up to planting, um, these are kind of the, the steps taken before we will get there to plant that will ensure low low weed population and uh, the, the best success for the, for the trial. So we suggest about one month before you go ahead and disc harrow and then three weeks we chisel plow and two weeks we wanna cultivate. And if you're going to add any soil amendments or fertilizer uh, doing that a day, you know, a day to a week um, in advance of planting, but ideally at the same time as your last cultivation. Um, so about one day before planting or the day of, if possible. Um, cultivation is very crucial uh, to allow, you have to get rid of all the, the weeds because um, they can really destroy your fields. So practicing a stale bed fallow where you allow the weeds to germinate before actually cultivating, whether that's rain or irrigation. Um, and then that will help limit the amount of weeds that will come up later on once you plant. So after planting, um, we have to cultivate between the rows. So it's super crucial that the first four times, so in about the first two weeks of planting to handle the weeds. Um, so we, the cultivator runs a, a spring or there's different types, but between each row to take out the weeds. So doing this um, four times in the first 14 days can control up to 80% of the problems. Um, and then when your canopy starts to close, you're unable to cultivate. So you really need to handle it before that happens. And then if you can plant as straight and uniform as possible, it makes cultivation much easier and lowers the risk of actually damaging your plants. So these four pictures show what bad organic management looks like. This is actually one of our locations we had um, that we end up losing 
due to weeds. So the first picture is a few weeks after planting and as it progresses, and you can see where there once were plots, you see the markers it just disappeared. And this is what or good organic management looks like. Um, this is a WP Raw, Ben Dubar does a great job, um, but just having the, the alleyways and between the roads very clear. I mean, there's no weeds, so we have no issues and the trials do very well. So I'm just gonna go through some of the disease and insects um, problems that we saw in the trials. And these photos show some of the classic symptoms of disease and often they show more than one disease at play. So the first one is powdery mildew. So this is probably the disease we see the most, especially with the warmer weather and high humidity and we get a lot of rain. Um, and, but the infection tends to vary based off of uh, the resistance of the different cultivars or lines. Um, but you can see in the first photo, just the powdery white, um, it's the fungus growing on the actual leaves. And that's, that's a fairly severe um, case right there. And then when it's the worst, we typically get what is in picture three and four where it goes all the way to the pods. So bacterial blight, um, we see these water soaked lesions and that are vein delimited and angular on the leaves typically. And this is all, um, most common late in the season with the warmer weather and precipitation. We do see it, but it's rarely uh, severe enough to cause you know, like agronomic loss. So our third one is ascocata blight. So these small irregular dark lesions on, most of these pictures are on the pods, but they can be on the leaves and stems. Um, it is more frequent with the cooler, wet weather. And it is common, but it's rarely severe. Um, and we haven't noticed, you know, a loss from it for the most part. And you can also kind of see on some of these leaves in the first photo and the third, that there is powdery mildew is there as well. All right. So jumping into insects, um, Aphids are probably our number one insect, and they can be really bad. Um, but when we get late in the season, when it starts to warm up, you know, that they can get, you know, an infestation can grow in a week really, really bad. So they're feeding on typically the, the buds or the younger foliage, and you'll kind of see them on the underside of leaves or between two new leaves growing. Um, you know, leave behind a sticky residue if they're feeding there. So it's kind of one way to tell if you haven't seen them. Um, and they're a vector for viral pathogens, so it can be a huge issue. And it's often seen that uh, plots with the most aphids typically have the most disease. Um, and really, organically, I mean, your options are limited. So your one of your best bets is just natural predators. So we, as you can see in the third picture, we have ladybugs. Um, and then you can also in the third, the black kind of looking aphids, those are the ones that have been parasitized. So they're, they're dead as well. So the second insect is fairly rare, but we do see it later on in the season and it's the Southern green, green stink bug. It's like I said, it's really rare and we only would see it late in the season and it's typically only immatures. Um, and I think number three is the fifth instar and in number two we're seeing the first or second. So we don't really know what the, the damage is done to the plants but we don't think it's very much just because it's so late in the season before harvest. I um, mean it is also a vector for pathogens as it will feed on the pods. So now I'm just gonna go through some of our, some photos from our field trials so you can see what, um, what our locations look like. So this is WP Rollins Sons in 2019. 
Um, these are our advanced trials. Well, except for the top left, that is our commercial acre of Hampton peas. So this is Clemson in 2019. Um, and it's the same, same thing. This is just our advanced trials, um, as you can see. And you can kind of tell a difference in the soil type as well. It's, we have more of a clay-based soil um, compared to the sandy soil. So this is WP Rawl in 2020. Um, the trial turned out great. Uh, everything looked really well. Um, our top left picture is about, I'd say a week, week and a half before harvest because they dry out really fast, um, getting late in May with how hot it is. So this is the same year at WP Rawl, but this is our germplasm. Um, you can tell how they're much smaller plots with only four rows um, that we ended up hand harvesting, but it's a very genetically diverse group of plants and there's a lot to see there. So this was Clemson in 2020 and that is why we weren't unable to have a location um, because there's supposed to be a road running from left to right where we access our fields, but we had a lot of rain that year. Some acknowledgements, I wanted to thank our field team, uh, Brad Stansel and his crop improvement team, Ben Dubar at WP Rollins Sons, David Robb at Clemson Organic Farm, and Matt Myers of the APT at Clemson University. And also our research team and collaborators, Rebecca McGee, uh, Emerson Scheip, Rick Boyles, and Dil Favaraja. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that um, Rick can share his. Okay. Thank you, Alice. You're welcome. So we're gonna shift gears a little bit here and, and, and talk some sorghum um, as, as Alice mentioned earlier in the talk, I, my name is Rick Boyles. I'm, I'm here with Clemson University as well. And I am the lead sorghum and small grains breeder and geneticist. I'm located not on main campus, but at the PD Research Center, which is located in Florence, South Carolina. What I wanted to highlight, we've talked a little bit about sorghum has been discussed about some of the quality components, but just to give you the 10,000 foot view real quick before we dive in. Sorghum is a very genetically diverse crop. It was originated in Africa. So it's very, very climate resilient, um, water use efficient. And it's labeled as an, a gluten-free ancient grain cereal crop. And it grows similar to corn with the exception of it has an unexposed panicle at the top of the plant. The, the, the background picture there it's our 2019 field trials that, was, that were grown also in Pillion, South Carolina. You can see it's a real clean field. It's only about 30 to 40 days after planting, so it's still in the vegetative stage. So one thing that I wanted to point out right off the bat, and I must admit going into this project, which was uh, we were glad to have support from the USDA NIFA ORI program, I was a little bit skeptical <laughs> about producing sorghum organically just because, especially in our region with our environments, there's a lot of challenges, including the high humidity and temperatures, but also we have a ton of pests and diseases. And uh, sorghum is a hardy crop that can endure a lot, but we just didn't know. There's not a lot of research that's available on this subject of organic sorghum. So a lot of this was somewhat of a black box. However, with that being said, both years of the trial that we've, um, that, that we've evaluated sorghum, which was 2019 and 2020, top entries yielded over 100 bushels per acre uh, in both years of the study. So we're definitely able to produce sorghum organically and we were quite successful at it within the first couple of years. A couple of things just to point out before 
we get into more specifics. Some of these are quite obvious, um, but, but I think even more so uh, for organic sorghum production, cultivar and hybrid selection is even more critical than I would say conventional. It's always important, but um, as you'll see, we'll have a wide variation in yield productivity and, and quality of the crop. And uh, it, really, it really pays off to select the right variety that has a strong, a strong base of disease and pest resistance, as well as good agronomic and quality trades. Also, knowing the history of the field, um, especially the, the weed pressures that you, you are likely to see is, is certainly important. Um, so you can be prepared to be successful and, and expect the challenges and, and be ready for them. Um, and then also soil testing is important in, in, in growing everything and, and under whatever conditions. And then finally, I wanted to highlight a little bit about marketing options and where to sell. This is still ongoing. We're still working with, with different industries and communities to figure out um, make it a little bit easier for growers to, to, to figure out these things. So that's what we're going to be doing a lot on the back end of the project. So a quick outline here. Um, I wanted to build off of what Tristan um, talked about on the management side with field peas and just highlights what we did with sorghum in our locations in these first couple of years, what worked and what maybe not worked so well. And then also I want to highlight the traits of importance that, that we should focus on um, for organic production. And I'll, I'll go into a little bit of detail on that. And then, and then third, uh, I'll summarize the cultivar and hybrid performance. Uh, we, as you'll see in the next couple of slides, we, uh, we evaluate a lot of different sorghums. And so we wanted to see which, um, which sorghums perform best and and, uh, and which ones were commercially available to growers right now and uh, would have the best opportunities for success. And then lastly, again, uh, trying to talk about some ways to um, try to help secure profitability, um, choosing the right hybrid again, but, but also the marketing component. The nutrient requirements uh, for sorghum, um, they're, generally, the requirements are similar to corn or maize, but um, for the, the trials that we had, we, uh, as Dill mentioned earlier in her talk, we followed um, a winter field pea crop that was grown from January to May, and we planted right after that um, into a dist field of um, from, from the field pea crop, and, and that allowed us to take advantage of uh, the nitrogen fixation that was uh, provided by field pea. And so in our high yielding environment in Clemson, we didn't apply any uh, nutrient amendments, no fertilizer amendments, either pre-plant or during the season, which, you know, would be a rare, um, probably a rare environment or, or situation for most growers. But um, that kind of uh, was con in contrast to the pillion or marginal environment, which is more representative of what I'd call the Atlantic coastal plain here in South Carolina and, and, and along the eastern United States, um, to where it's a more sandier soil that's low water holding capacity and uh, there's a lot of nutrient leaching. And so we did have to apply 540 pounds per acre of 6011 NPK at pre plant along with a a little bit of manganese and, and magnesium added. And, um, and then we only applied a micronutrient solution vegetative growth stage during the season, but that was more preventative and preemptive and probably could have done away with that. More, more specifically on weed management, we knew weeds, uh, weed control was going to be a, uh, a, you know, at the top of the list of, of being successful. Um, and uh, we did things a little bit differently just based on capabilities per location. And in Florence, South Carolina, uh, we basically just relied on in row cultivation only using 30 inch row spacing. And you can see between the rows, yes, they're clean here about, again, 45 days after planting. But if you look closer in, within the rows or near the rows of the sorghum plant where those arrow, red arrows are pointing, you can see some grass weeds coming up. 
Here in, uh, in South Carolina, we have a lot of grass weed pressure, uh, mainly Texas panicum and Bermuda grass. And then our broadleaf weeds pr primarily consist of Palmer amaranth, <clears throat> excuse me, um, morning glory and sickle pod. In the pillion location, however, we took a much more intensive approach. Um, we talk, uh, Tristan talked a little bit about a stale bed fallow. We did that the same way in sorghum, following up to planting um, to where we disc the field pea in in May. Uh, we did a couple more discings uh, or cultivations over the top to uh, eliminate any uh, newly emerging weeds. So we started clean. Starting clean is imperative in sorghum because compared to corn or maize, it's slower growing initially. And then once you hit about 30 to 40 days, you, it almost has an exponential growth rate. And that's likely due to its smaller seed size. But, but nevertheless, starting clean is, is really important. So if you could keep the sorghum crop clean within the first month or so, you can really be successful. And so we did rely on in-row cultivation, but one of the things differently that we did was we included blind cultivation. And that means just cultivating before the sorghum seedlings emerge. So after planting, but before emergence. And we were only able to rely on this technique because we had GPS guidance control at this location. And it, it really increased our possibilities. And you can see the, you know, there, there's very little weeds, if any, uh, between the rows or in the rows. And we also used a colt crest finger weeder to throw dirt at the base of the sorghum plant once the plants got high enough to minimize those grass weeds again that you see in the in the left picture that was that showed up in Florence. This was done on 38 inch row spacings um, to, to enable uh, the cultivation implements to to work a little bit better with the crop. And, and also we did a little bit of handheld spot flame weeding just with a handheld torch um, to get broadleaf weeds, mainly Palmer amaranth. So disease and insect management, this is really easy. We didn't do anything. <laughs> and, and the main reason we didn't do anything because we wanted to evaluate the crop performance under natural stress. Certainly there were pests and diseases that we, that we observed, but we wanted to rate for natural disease tolerance um, by different genotypes, as well as um, a natural tolerance to insect feeding. On the left, you see uh, a plant covered up in the sugarcane aphid, which has uh, showed up in sorghum several years ago and is a prominent pest. And then I just included this picture on the right of the snake that cropped up in the sorghum, just because I thought it was a cool picture, not really a pest there. As far as the field trial overview, not too different from what we did in field P, except sorghum is a row crop. So we did two row plots of 20 foot length. We've talked about the locations and the years of the study. What I really wanted to point out, and I don't know if you can see my pointer, but if you look in, in the class, there are three grain sorghum types that we evaluated. We evaluated 70 hybrids. We evaluated 72 advanced breeding lines from the Clemson University breeding program. And we also evaluated 43 total land races that were from the Sorghum Association panel, which represents global sorghum diversity. Just because again, there's been very little research on what varieties might perform well under this different less intensive management style that organic systems require. <clears throat> and so we wanted to evaluate a whole host of different genotypes just to see, you know, how the cream, what cream rose to the top, so to speak. We also evaluated 10 sweep sorghum lines because there is interest in organic sweep sorghum. And then we also included four commercially available maize hybrids in the study because we wanted to compare grain sorghum yield uh, with, with maize or corn in the same trial. So there's a ton of, total of 199 entries that we evaluated both years in both environments. Okay, so in terms of the traits that we evaluated, um, the main ones that I really want to point out for this talk that, that we found to be very important were canopy closure, 
this is something that we've seen in other 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 crops excuse me such as wheat and that early canopy closure is is very important to decrease weed pressure and we saw the same in sorghum so early season vigor increasing the canopy closure more vegetative biomass generally led to higher yields at the end of the season another trait that was very important that we knew was going to be important going in was sugarcane aphid tolerance. And these numbers, you don't have to pay too much attention to, but if you want to know more about it, a negative number means it was negatively correlated with grain yields. So increased sugarcane aphid pressure led to decreased yields, which makes sense. And then an increased canopy closure led to increased sorghum yields. So a positive relationship there. And then the relative maturity ratings that we that we took generally in most environments had a negative correlation. But I want to point out that this is a confounding factor with sugarcane aphid tolerance because if I show in the next slide here, sugarcane aphid tolerance, what it does is there's so much aphid feeding. If you look at these susceptible lines, which you can see the on the right of both pictures here. Um, there's, there's chlorosis or yellowing of the leaves going on and you don't see heads emerging. That's just because there's so much aphid feeding and sucking the, the sugars and the energy from the plant that it, it just can't exert a head and produce much, if any, yield at all. However, on the SCA tolerant lines, which they're grown right beside each other, this line is just a uh, just a line to show you the separate plots, but these are grown right next to one another. One is just hammered with aphids on the right, and then on the left, you hardly have any aphid um, damage signs at all. Now, there's aphids here if we were to look under the leaves, but um, this is why we call it aphid tolerance, is that plant's able to tolerate the aphid feeding and still produce a very high yield. And the same way with this, this short early line on the left, or I'm sorry, on the right picture on the left side of the right picture, if you can see my cursor there. So a wide range in this trade existed, and we obviously want to select a sugarcane aphid tolerant hybrid or cultivar when, when, when making our decisions for organic management. A second trait that is very important in our location and in many locations for sorghum is anthracnose resistance. It's called by the caused by the fungus Colatotricum. And it's you can clearly see the again, these these plots are growing right beside each other. The left two rows are a susceptible hybrid, the right two rows are a resistant hybrid. And you can see just the difference in healthy leaf color on the right compared to the left. And you can see a difference in yield there as well, just observing that. We didn't see as much anthracnose pressure in our first two years of our organic trials as we expected. It was there and I expect it to be there. The only thing I could say to that is why we might not have observed much pressure as to the history of those fields, kind of going back to that knowledge of field history, we didn't have any field history of sorghum grown in that area. So that might be one of the reasons of low disease incidence. We did have a lot of grain mold, however, and caused by uh, a multitude of, of fungi, but mainly Fusarium species. Um, we rated grain mold in the field um, once the, uh, the grain uh, or the sorghums were near physiological maturity. And on the left, on uh, the lower numbers represent a resistant uh, hybrid or cultivar to grain mold, the right not so much, um, being more susceptible. I don't know if that mold shows up very well in those images, but I really just wanted to show you the rain. And we rate it actually on a one to nine scale. And if you look at the graph here, these are directly from the, the 2020 uh, organic sorghum trials um, just from last year. And you can see that entries that had a <clears throat> a grain mold rating between one and four, they yielded significantly better on average than those entries that were rated much more susceptible or had a higher rating of five or more. So it really hurt grain yield, but grain mold 
obviously also hurt screen quality as well. I've got a little video here um, just to give you a better understanding of, of the harvest process. And there's a couple of traits associated with this that I just lumped together. Um, one being standability, um, which is the opposite of lodging. So uh, it's pretty uh, obvious trait to where we want all the plants standing up at the end of the year, as you can see that these are standing up and they're able to easily harvest it and they're not falling on the ground. Exertion, on the other hand, is the, the length of the, let's see if I could get another snapshot here, the length of the panicle from the rest of the vegetative uh, plant. So you can see from the base of the panicle, if you can see my cursor on the, on the right side of this image, all the way down to the vegetative tissues. That would what we measure it called exertion. And the higher the exertion, the easier it is to cleanly harvest a crop with minimal biomass and, and which leads to moisture issues and other problems, uh, just uh, dirtiness in your final grain harvest. So uh, that leads to the threshability. So um, fortunately our hybrids uh, or some of our entries did very well and had good, um, good ratings for all of these different traits. Okay, the, the next trait that I wanted to highlight is grain quality and composition. Now, I don't have enough time to highlight this and, and, and deal, Dr. Thavaraha mentioned this earlier, is that sorghum has a lot of nutritional benefits. It's got a range of diversity within the grain itself. You can see that uh, there's a lot of variation in between the, 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 the entry with the lowest starch content at 54% dry basis to over 75% dry basis in the highest um, the, the genotype with the highest starch content and protein you can see as well over double 13.6% protein all the way down to 6%. And this continues throughout the range of traits. This was not unexpected because we had a lot of diverse lines, but what this is important and why I get excited working with sorghum as a breeder is that we can take advantage of all this natural variation that is non-GM and we can optimize the nutrient composition for the end use. So whether it's, you know, sorghum is commonly grown as a, as a feed ingredient for, for poultry, for hogs. Um, and, and also there's, because it's gluten-free ancient grain, it's, it's produced in a, or used for a lot of different food products. You can pop sorghum like you can popcorn. Uh, you can, you can use it to make beer. Uh, if you've ever heard of Red, Red Bridge beer, uh, it's a sorghum based beer and, and there's other gluten free beers as well. A lot of those are made from sorghum. All right, so now I wanted to shift very quickly to talk about the, the performance of the different entries and how they stacked up and I mentioned those three grain classes and I wanted to talk about that first. Um, if you just look at the grain classes, how, how they averaged um, by class. Um, typically, like corn, you see a phenomenon in sorghum called hybrid vigor or heterosis to where a hybrid will perform much better than its parents to inbred parents. And that was the case in this trial. You could see both in 2019 and over here in 2020, the hybrid, if you look at the letter designation, significantly outperformed both the advanced breeding lines, which are in, in, is an orange, and then the diverse land races from, from the sorghum association panel. What I also want to point out, however, is that there's a lot of variation here across the, across the different classes. And uh, there's a couple here, uh, advanced breeding lines that perform very well. So a 4,000 kilogram per hectare yield, for an example, would be about 40, I'm sorry, about 60 bushels per acre, 60, 70 bushels per acre. And I'll show it in the next slide. So in bushels per acre. So here are the top yielding entries. Um, these are the top 12 or 13 uh, grain sorghum entries that, that were under evaluation. Two things, that there's a lot of data points on this slide and you don't have to worry about all of them, but uh, what, I, what I wanted to point out was first is that there were three commercially available hybrids in this test that we, we evaluated 
that ranked in the top 12 and, and were really high yielding. And, and, and so that there, there's promise and, and that shows there, there's already um, sorghum hybrids that are commercially available on the market today for growers who might be interested in trying sorghum organically. And the second thing what I wanted to point out is that we did have some advanced breeding lines. This is from the Clemson program. And I guess if I should back up and say, TAMU-5 is from the Texas A&M uh, breeding program. It's a hybrid. The BRDs are also hybrids, but they're from the Clemson program. And then the, these PV20s that are highlighted in blue are advanced breeding lines. So they're pure lines, pure cultivars, not hybrids um, from crossing two parents. Why is that important? Well, hybrid seed production is a, is a major cost to the industry. And um, while it's very important and there's, there's a plenty of utility and, and demand for hybrids conventionally, I, I just, I wonder if there's a justification to eliminate this step by, uh, in the organic sector by providing very improved uh, advanced breeding lines or inbred lines that we can skip the hybrid production step. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a thought, it's not necessary, but it, if there is a major challenge in, in providing seed to organic growers this might be an option or opportunity to take advantage of by just improving inbred lines without having to deal with the hybrid production process. That being said, there are plenty of, or, or a number of potential seed providers. And I just listed a few, this is not an, an entire list by any means. Uh, one thing to point out is uh, Blue River Organic Seed, Carolina Seed Systems, and Richardson Seeds, all three had um, commercially available hybrids in the trial that performed within the top 12. Now, the other three listed here and the others, other companies that provide sorghum, we just didn't have representative entries from these, these companies. And that's not as to say they don't have very good germplasm and genetics that will suit organic sorghum. It's just we didn't have the capacity to evaluate uh, entries from every company. And then I mentioned the marketing possibilities. You know, where are you going to sell sorghum if you do produce it successfully? Again, we, we've got a lot of work to do with this. And unfortunately, we've got the United Sorghum Checkoff Program working uh, heavily on this to find uh, niche markets like organic uh, sorghum production to, to make sure that um, th there's going to be a vertically integrated supply chain and there's going to be demand for your organic sorghum produced. Um, there's also, you know, there's also certain trading platforms, and I think uh, there was an eOrganics webinar not too long ago for, that had a representative from Recaris. There's also Combine as well. So there are options out there. Um, but again, we want to be able to provide better information out um, to, to growers and, and interested stakeholders on this. And we're going to be working with, with groups like the Sorghum Checkoff Program and working with companies to try to get information out to growers on uh, on where to you know who is buying it who may be buying it and and what are the options and where are they located so that that'll be what we're focusing on in the latter half of the project one other thing i wanted to mention too is that uh dill and and i and tristan and, and everyone as part of this talk we will be having a an organic plant breeding institute workshop which will be a four-day workshop that, that was originally scheduled for may of last year but of course um, our plans were derailed um, due to the pandemic so we, we've now rescheduled to june of this coming year it will be virtual but it will be a free registration and so it was originally intended for students graduate and undergraduates which it will still be focused on that but there will be opportunities to maybe um, to join in as a grower or other stakeholder of interest and, and be able to learn more about what we're doing than what we could provide in just an hour or so in today's talk. Um, and so um, with that, I'd like to just acknowledge, um, you know, everyone that's on the project team, of course, and, and our collaborators. And um, it really, you know, Dill highlighted this. It, this is a very, um, 
you know, team oriented project is it involves a lot of hands it involves a lot of collaboration and, and to, to be able to do this variety testing and, and on farm certified organic. And we were just pleased the way the first couple of years turned out and happy with the results so far and excited about to see where it goes in the future. And uh, y'all stay tuned and hopefully we'll have more information in the next couple of years. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Alice and, and thanks again. Yeah, thank you. It sounds like a really exciting project. And um, we're going to start our question and answer period now. I know some of you have already been typing in questions into the Q&A box. Um, so if you have a question, just type it in and um, we'll be reading the questions out loud um, for the next half hour or so, um, as long as we have enough questions. And um, if you don't see the Q&A box, just hover over the bottom of your screen and there should be a bar with some controls and you just have to click on the Q&A one and that will open it up. Um, I also wanted to mention again that this presentation is being recorded. So if you want to hear something again, um, you can look it up on the eOrganic YouTube channel within one to two weeks. Um, we'll also be sending the attendees a copy of a slide handout as well as a follow-up survey with a link. And so um, we'd really appreciate it if you could fill out the follow-up survey. So um, I'm going to just move on here. Let me pull up the Q&A box on my screen. Um, okay, um, we had a question, a couple questions. Um, how much does it cost per sample to get the mineral analysis? Um, I believe that was in Dill's part of the presentation. And how is that done? Um, so generally take uh, $10 to $15 total cost. So how it's done is we get the dry grain sample, grind it, digest it overnight, and then we run through the inductive couple of plasma, and then we can get the sweep of minerals, about 15 minerals. So that's how it's done. And it costs about $10 to range of $15. Okay, and then um, from the same person, we have another question on whether or not you get any premium for biofortified field peas over regular. Well, I don't think that is the case at the moment. That's what we wanted to make it because biofortified organic peas has low protein compared to the conventional peas. So if, we, if our peas also can produce the same as that protein content, um, because pulses will be graded based on the protein percentage and good quality, uh, high grade, medium grade, and low grade. So we wanted to have that into our organic piece as well. It's not there yet, but I hope it will come to the future. Okay. Um, here's a production question. I don't know. Um, if you're not unmuted, you can go ahead and unmute yourself before you answer. This one might be for Tristan. Do you end trim the plots before harvest of the field pea? Um, yes, well, we, we keep the alleyways maintained. Um, so there's the five feet on either end. Um, in the future, we will be trimming them, you know, so we can do a measurement and get the exact length. So they all are um, the same. So yes and no, but if that answers the question. Okay. Um, and, then, and then just to weigh in on the sorghum side, even though I think it was toward peel, peel, peel. for sorghum, we did not have to rely. We used to end trim everything, but we don't do it anymore because of we're, we're fortunate enough to have GPS um, enabled planners that will literally drop the first and last seed exactly where you want it to go. And so you can, you can have exactly that five foot alley that Tristan was talking about with ha without having staggered plots from row to row. Okay. But this is a very good question, Dr. Scheib, and I always talk about it to trim it. Dr. Scheib, you want to comment on our discussion on the trimming for the P plots? Yes. Um, yeah, we're still, uh, I think, improving some of our field plot techniques, and uh, uh, we, uh, we're working to, so that we uh, get a more precise uh, measurement of, of our seed yields. So we're, 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 we're working to improve those uh, so, so that we can, uh, as we evaluate the, in the advanced trial or the cultivar trials of other 
materials from other breeding programs and then as we uh, out there in the future start evaluating air uh, breeding lines that we hope to develop that we'll have a we'll have a good system and we'll have a uh, uh, an improved approach in the, in our field measurements. Okay. Um, thank you. Do you, for sorghum, um, how much tillering did you see? That's a good question. Um, we saw a very wide range in uh, across the different genotypes. Um, there's a, a genetic component to tillering in sorghum as well as an environmental component. Um, with, with plant density being a major environmental component, you know, how packed in are the, are the individual sorghum plants. And, um, and generally you see uh, within the organic trial, uh, we had favorable growing conditions and you saw uh, at least two to three tillers per plant. Now we, we planted about 100,000 seeds per acre um, with, with the hope of getting 80% germination for 80,000 plants per acre stand. And so that allows for some tillering, but um, we, we also, you know, we went a little higher plant density, which would lower tillering just because we wanted to uh, decrease weed competition and, and increase canopy closure a little bit quicker. Okay, yeah, sort of a related question here. Um, can you be more specific about the canopy cover measurement procedure? Oh, yeah, another good question. This, this would just be a, a rating scale on a one to nine scale with one being absolutely no canopy closure between the rows and nine being comp complete canopy closure to where if you were to look down in between the rows, you would not see any bare ground. It would just be um, full vegetative biomass from the sorghum leaves. So it was a more of a crude measurement, but it was an easy way to quickly rate, you know, 200, 200 entries replicated twice across two locations, as you can imagine. Uh, it would take a long time to do things more quantitatively. Um, one thing we are looking at in the future is measuring that using um, UAV-based drone imaging. And, and, and some people are already doing that and with other crops and in other situations. Okay, um, this is a question directed to Rick. Um, do you measure the heads per plot? We do for certain genetic studies, but because we're interested in looking at, there's four major yield components in sorghum um, with, with one being the number of plants per area, two would be uh, the number of heads per plant, three would be the number of grains per panicle, and the fourth one would be the size of those grains. And, and certainly the yield component breakdown or percentage and how that correlates to overall yield is important to us. For this study, we didn't just because we knew we were going to harvest with a combine and that the combine grain yield would give us the results that we needed to make early decisions for um, which, which cultivars and hybrid would perform best in this environment. Okay, um, here's a question about whether the um, P advanced lines and breeding lines were developed at Clemson. Um, I know there was mention of some lines being developed in Canada, um, but do you want to talk um, about Yeah, so the, uh, the cultivars that we tested in this uh, study was uh, from Meridian Seed and USA Pulse. Those were developed by Crop Development Center Saskatchewan and the Agriculture Agri-Food Canada in Alberta, uh, those two graders. But we bought those uh, seeds from the seed, two seed companies, Meridian Seed and the USA Pulse. And the breeding lines were from Dr. Rebecca Maggie's program. That's her, pro her line. Uh, we did not have anything ready for us like because this is brand new our program is only two years so yeah i'd be hoping to test our lines um within the next two years okay um let's see um here's a question about how many of the south carolina farms that are in organic production could utilize this cropping system and 
you know, I guess I was just also wondering um, where else could utilize this cropping system? Rick, you wanna take it? Sure do, I'll take a stab. Um, I don't know is in terms of the number of, of organic farms, um, it's just rapidly changing here in our state, much less, you know, the regions of, of, of interest. There's, um, you know, these, these crops are very diverse and they're, they're climate resilient. And, you know, Dill just mentioned that peas are coming from Washington state. And, uh, and so they can be grown in a variety of different environments and, and the same for sorghum. Um, it doesn't like the cold near as much as, as uh, obviously field peas being a warm season crop, but, but it is grown um, conventionally at least uh, uh, up and down the eastern coast uh, to the mid-south in Arkansas, to Louisiana, and, and the ma main growing region is Kansas up through the, the Dakotas with, with Kansas being the number one producing state uh, right, right in front of Texas. So it can also perform out west as far as California, and California is looking at a lot of acres increasing a lot of acres as well just because of the water limitations that we're seeing and same way with with the with the high plains is when, where there's limited water availability sorghum is uh is an excellent crop um to uh to be able to take advantage of and 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 it has great water use efficiency and can tolerate extreme heat um yes so, and also uh -huh. Also, I can add that into like uh, most of it, this. This is a system that we are developing, and it it can be uh, mostly pulses have to be rotated with a cereal crop or an oil crop to break the disease cycle. So this has been done in Canada and Dakota, like, and uh, it's nicely fit for South Carolina, and that's why we tried with the sorghum. But also, you could try this rotation with the wheat as well in the different systems. But I know internationally they try this in uh, India and Africa as well. Okay, have you tried intercropping these two crops? We haven't. It's something that, that might be worth considering. Um, I, I've thought about that, but the problem is, um, uh, I've. I, I should back up. I've thought about intercropping sorghum with a legume. As far as winter field pea, obviously the growing seasons are too different. Uh, maybe Dill um, could speak to, you know, some other legumes that she works with that might could work in an intercropping system. Um, but uh, just uh, um, the growing seasons don't work out very well for, for intercropping, even though it makes sense from a standpoint of a, a legume providing nitrogen back into the soil for a cereal crop to utilize throughout the growing season. I, I can add a little bit, Rick, and I have been talking about Rick's other crop is winter wheat. She, he's a breeder for that as well. So I'm working on lentil and pea, so which is a cool season food legume, which fits for the winters in South Carolina. So we could do intercropping with uh, winter wheat, but for the summer, Easily, we could have uh, mung bean, well, not the mung bean, the, the uh, black eyed peas. South is like really famous for black eyed peas. So we could actually intercrop with black eyed pea legume system, which I don't work with. I work only lentils and peas. Okay, um, here's a question for Tristan. Um, you have seen powdery mildew. Um, Let's see, I don't know if I can pronounce this properly, Ascochyta blight and Ascochyta blight in your pea trials. Did you evaluate individual test entries for each disease and are you considering um, genetic studies to determine the basis of resistance? Okay, so y yes, we've seen all three of those diseases and more. Um, we haven't, we didn't evaluate our entries specifically for like disease resistance for a particular, you know, pathogens, but um, they were more conducted for an overall performance in general resistance to disease, which, which entries are going to have the most versus the least impact. Um, as far as the genetic basis of resistance, um, not at the moment, but maybe moving forward, 
you know, with, with our own breathing lines um, and such. Right. Dill might be able to help out more on that side. Yeah. I'll, I'll say something about that. Yes, this is <laughs> Dr. Scheip and I have been laying out the program for the yield and this is resistant because we have to look at the agronomic adaptability for the state. Yes, we are planning to have a disease resistance screening for our own lines and also help with Rebecca because that's one of her expertise. And also we are planning to reach out to the Montana uh, state disease, uh, um, disease experts in there too. Um, this is not something that I can help with. That's not my expertise. So we are hoping to do genetic studies and actually having someone look taking over the pathology side of the process. Yes. Okay. Uh, this is Emerson. I might just uh, comment that uh, you know, as, as our program moves forward, uh, I'm sure we're going to uh, deal with uh, more pests. I anticipate that and certainly uh, uh, building in genetic uh, disease resistance will, will be an important part of our program. Uh, so uh, yeah, I think it'll probably become more important uh, as we move further into the program because I anticipate we may see uh, possibly other other diseases. Thank you. Okay. Um, if here's a question from a student, um, if a student had applied to the Plant Breeding Institute in 2020, um, do they need to sign up again for the institute this June? Uh, yes. Also, we could reach out to them, but we would prefer them to register because this time it's a webinar. Okay. Um, thank you. And um, let's see, here's another question just going down the line here. Um, do you have any suggestions to save carbon in the soil with organic peas, um, but, um, you know, I guess no till or less tillage, um, but if, you know, but if you don't want weeds is the question. Rick, you want to take first? Yeah, just in general, uh, I think the no-till, um, I don't know, you know, I'm, being a breeder and geneticist, I'm, I'm, I'm not an agronomist, so I can't speak too much to this, but my general thoughts and what I've seen with, with the crops that I work with is uh, organically where we are with the long growing season, no-till is very challenging to reduce weeds. I'm not saying it's impossible and we shouldn't try to do that in the future, but um, it, without cultivation, we would struggle to have a crop. Um, now there may be some innovative, innovative excuse me, innovative uh, management techniques that we could utilize without deep cultivation, but I think it was a struggle for our region specifically in the southeastern U.S. I agree with Rick, same kind of thing for us too, like for the peas. The weed control is the problem. So without having the clean field, it is very difficult um, to save it. Um, but if you can add the residue back to the field, that, that we have to think about it, how we can add back the biomass to the soil. But this is a challenging situation and we are just trying for first two years. I don't know, Dr. Shai, being an agronomist, you have any suggestions? I would just, I would agree with what uh, Rick and, and you said. It seems that, uh, you know, cultivation is, is critical for organic production. Okay. Um, one more, looks like we have a last question here. Um, with the regenerative agriculture movement and the demand for locally grown plant-based foods and gluten-free concern, um, the market may look good. Do you have any thoughts about this or how can it be developed more? Should I go first, Rick, or you wanna go? You take that deal. <laughs> okay. So um, I think it is really interesting, especially with the plant-based protein. So one of the things that Rick and I was doing, like 
I have a pea protein, Rick has sorghum protein. When we mix this together, we have the balanced protein. So that's why this other thing we were talking about, nutritional breeding, means that uh, we are developing something like a system approach. Having a, It's not only you can eat rice. You have to mix that with the process. So then only you can have a balanced diet. So that's the example of protein. But not only that, having gluten-free, allergen-free, chemical-free, organic going to be uh, next next demand because most of the people are switching from um, meat to vegetarian diet. Uh, one thing be- because of this pandemic and the food distribution and the energy requirements. So I think future going to be really good for organic production and that, that's going to be a new avenue um, for many reasons because of the emerging diseases. Uh, the use of pesticide and the conventional farming. So I think we have a much better future. I'm optimistic about that. Yeah, and and I would just add a, a quick comment. And, and first, I agree with this comment. There is a lot of, a lot of positivity here. Um, uh, you know, one, one of the issues, and Dill talked about it earlier, is, is we just don't have the information um, available to us to to answer all the questions uh, regarding management or regarding to variety selection. And, and that's, that was the purpose of, of looking at these crops and in this system is we want to just, you know, if there is demand for it, which there seems to be for these crops for plant-based proteins, we want to have the information for growers and, and our stakeholders to, 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 to allow them to be as successful as they can be. Um, I just had one last question here since we have a couple minutes left. I was wondering if you'd been developing any new foods or beverages or anything like that um, with these foods. Um, I will, Rick, should I take it? Oh, you want to talk about it. I'll let you talk most. I, I will say <laughs> this, Alice, I, I'm staring in front of me at three pounds of uh, organically grown sorghum white flour that we're going to be trying out some different bread recipes. Wow. So we're going to be doing a little bit of that on our side, just tinkering, yep. Uh, we did quite a bit of uh, food workshops with the students and South Carolina Governor's School, many, many things with uh, having pea, pea powdered and uh, organic sorghum powdered. We made some breakfast, breakfast food and we made some delicious bread, uh, pancakes, many, many different food products, also smoothies we made, and also some uh, new invention that we do in our lab. We just uh, patterned, uh, we did this the proportional pattern for organic protein extraction procedure. And so many, many new things happening in our lab as innovation with the grad students and um, um, a lot of new food products, smoothies, and you'll hear a lot from Clemson. Okay. Well, thank every, thanks everybody for all those questions. And um, as I mentioned, you'll be able to find the recording in about a week on the eOrganic YouTube channel. And we'll be sending you a copy of the presentation along with a follow-up survey, which we'd be very grateful if you could fill out. So thank you so much, Dill, Tristan, Rick, and Emerson um, for coming today and presenting about your research. And um, we are presenting many more webinars this coming winter on insect management and weed management, uh, many of which focus on the southeast. And uh, you can subscribe to the eOrganic newsletter on our website at eOrganic.org to get our announcements. So thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one.